Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. It is indeed a pleasure tonight on Cinema Showcase to have as my guest one of America's best and best-known writers, Mr. Erskine Caldwell. His books have been read and discussed for the past 40 years, and several of them have been made into immensely popular films, including God's Little Laker and Tobacco Road. One of his finest works has just been reprinted. It's called You Have Seen Their Faces, done in collaboration with Margaret Burke White. We'll be talking about that book tonight, among other things, so join me as I talk with Erskine Caldwell on Cinema Showcase. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase tonight. And Mr. Caldwell, thank you very much for coming. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, Jim. You Have Seen Their Faces is, I think, one of the most striking books of its kind I have ever seen. Why, after so many years, has it uh, been reprinted? I really don't know. I can make a few guesses, I suppose, because I had nothing to do with it until uh, I was informed that a publisher wanted to uh, reprint it. Yeah, there's not the original publisher by any means. This mm -hmm. is another uh, set of people completely because uh, it was originally done in uh, 1937 and it was done then in uh, two editions, a hardcover edition and uh, several months later a paperback edition and of course that was many years ago. Uh, now this present operation uh, was started out with the Arno Press. Now the Arno Press is a subsidiary of the New York Times organization and they wanted to do a library edition of this book. Uh, for the public library, for school libraries, and class work, and so forth. So it was uh, projected originally as a as sort of a restricted type of publication for mm -hmm. a specific purpose and public. Now, uh, at that time, uh, I agreed to it, and we signed a contract and so forth. And then just a few weeks later, they came back and said they wanted to do a paperback edition uh, uh, also. And that was... Uh, let out to another publisher, which is called Derby Books. Mm -hmm. So there are two editions of this particular book at this time, the Arno Press edition, hardcover, and the Derby Books, which is the paper cover mm -hmm. edition. And uh, I, I think uh, the reason that uh, it was being done, well, it might be more than one reason, but one reason is the fact that it, it might have something to do with the fact that uh, uh, the book was pr uh, previously written and published during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm in the 1930s. And uh, recently, in the, in the past few uh, weeks and uh, few, uh, months and years, we've heard the expression used that we are in a recession, mm -hmm. uh, economic recession, I think it's called. Well, this might be, have some reference to the fact that it might uh, have some meaning at this time to look back to see what life was really like when there was a Great Depression mm -hmm. in this country, particularly in the South. In the South, uh, Unfortunately, I suppose you might say, it was the, uh, had the greatest depression of all because it was a cotton empire. Uh, people lived with cotton, they ate cotton, they slept with cotton. The whole, em the whole South was a cotton empire. And that brought about the downfall of the economic system as far as the South was concerned because right after that, the agricultural revolution took place and the cotton disappeared, except for the great plantations in along the Mississippi uh, River Valley. Mm -hmm. And then it moved westward into Texas, and then it went as far into New Mexico, Arizona, and California. So most of the cotton now is grown elsewhere, mm -hmm. out of the South. Yeah. So this is sort of a historical document, I suppose. Yeah. All right, how did the project originate back in 1937? Why did you decide to do it as a, a photographic essay, more or less? Well, because that was, uh, that was the, uh, the, the, the tempo of the times. Uh, the times were real tough for people. People were hungry. Uh, people were in bread lines in the cities. Uh, the, uh, the business was stagnant, uh, stagnant, uh, and uh, people had a, were doing a great hardship. And what I wanted to do was to uh, was to find the uh, the actual uh, uh, form of this uh, of this uh, Great Depression. What was what was it like to be in it? Mm -hmm. And Margaret Burke White had the same idea that she wanted to photograph the thing, 
And so we put the two ideas together, my idea to write about it and she to do the photography. So we collaborated with that in mind that uh, we wanted to show what, a, uh, what the, uh, what the uh, poverty was and how it looked on people's faces mm -hmm. and in their living conditions and so forth. Mm -hmm. All right, what was the, the strongest impression you came away with after what I assume was months of um well, it was, a, it was a, it the fact that uh, uh, that the people uh, were uh, uh, were enduring maybe the greatest hardship of, of American life mm -hmm. up until that time, and may it may never repeat itself. It may never be that hard again for, for the human spirit to endure. And uh, what what, the, what what came out of it is the fact that uh, that people were uh, were able to survive. Mm -hmm. In spite of the hunger, in spite of the, uh, the housing, in spite of the unemployment and so forth, people were, the spirit was uh, not broken. Mm -hmm. uh, the spirit survived. So I think it made the, uh, the South uh, a much stronger region because uh, after the enduring this hardship, I think it, it strengthened the, uh, uh, the personality and, and the, and the uh, outlook and the ambitions of people in the South. Mm -hmm. I wonder if perhaps that's one of the reasons the South has been in literature, certainly a more a more colorful region than any other part of this country. Perhaps the South has endured more. Is that one of the reasons? Well, of course, I say the reason so many people uh, write about the South and so why is there such a prolific uh, output of Southern writing is the fact that Southerns uh, uh, really don't know anything uh, except uh, can't do anything much except tell stories. So <laughs> instead of uh, working at some uh, uh, worthwhile project uh, like building something or making something or doing something, they just sit down and tell stories to each other. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the writers come along and pick up the same idea. Well, if there must, uh, so many uh, stories in existence, you might as well write them up in a book. Mm -hmm. And there yes. have been, oh well, my goodness, there have been a preponderance of our greatest writers who have come from the South. For well, this. yeah, 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 of course. Uh, of course, they, there might be other reasons than what I said. I'm, I'm just uh, <laughs> talking out of my top of my head. I don't know what I don't know why people write so much about the South, but yeah. uh, it is interesting to me. Sure, sure. Well, it's I'd much rather write a story about the South if I could than any other reason. I've written about other regions of the country, New England, and so forth, and mm -hmm. uh, up and down the Mississippi Valley. But the the Deep South to me is the gold mine for yeah. writing. Yeah. One of the things the, the essays in this book. I think argued for was a government commission to investigate the, the dilapidated agricultural system of the South. Did anything good come out of that? Well, I don't know that it did. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the government did enter it to, uh, into uh, existence of people's lives to some extent, and then there was so much uh, disagreement about the uh, government meddling uh, in people's lives that, that uh, uh, there was a lot of controversy going on at one time about uh, should the government uh, investigate anything? Should it just stay away and let people alone? Well, uh, I, I, I think uh, one thing that came out of the whole depression was the so-called writer's project, uh, the public the works programs and so forth, those things, uh, the, uh, the Civilian uh, Conservation Corps, mm -hmm. uh, that came out of that and put, gave people jobs raking leaves. That's about all they did, they say, is rake up leaves on the street. Mm -hmm. But at least they gave uh, people something to do, and that was a government project. And I suppose the soil conservation uh, originated then because soil was being eroded, washed away, and uncared for. So uh, right now there are many, many uh, soil conservation projects that are administered by the government. So that's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. So that's something that happened. Yeah. What was the general reaction to the book when it came out? Well, I don't think many people like to see it depicted as it was mm -hmm. because it was right on the poverty level and of course everybody uh, everybody was not in the same fix. Uh, there, was, uh, there were people who were affluent in bad times like that, uh, people who had enough to eat. Uh, for example, one of the, uh, one of the comments that uh, were made at one time right in Atlanta uh, was when Mrs. Roosevelt uh, came down to Atlanta on the way to Warm Springs, I suppose, but stopped in Atlanta, and, and someone asked her what she, uh, what she was going to do to help the people in the South uh, in their economic distress, and she said, I, I'm going to see that everybody has shoes to wear. Well, 
uh, people in Atlanta were wearing shoes, but mm -hmm. the people who without shoes were way out of sight in the country, so no one knew what, exactly what she was talking about in Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, bringing shoes to, for people in Atlanta to wear. That's right. That's right. One of the reviews, in fact, of, of the book, I think it was in Southern Review, uh, accused you of turning state's evidence or something and uh, said, how what? can a Southerner write, uh, write such things? Oh, well, I, I've had a lot of comments like that <laughs> made, yes, that I'm a communist and a socialist and everything else, a single taxer and uh, everything you can think of. I, I've had all those comments made, but they really don't bother me because I know what I am and I, I'm not uh, making any excuses for what I write and uh, as a writer, and uh, the fact that I uh, might have affronted somebody or uh, turned against something doesn't mean a thing to me because I was only reporting what I thought I was finding and to, for the for the good of the uh, of the uh, of the subject I was working with. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, though, you touched on this? Why do you think Southerners, in particular, were were so enraged? Uh, well, of course, uh, people have uh, pride. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like you, if you uh, criticize someone's uh, dress, uh, the kind of clothes he was wearing or she was wearing or something, well, a person doesn't like that personal criticism, I suppose. And so uh, Southerners have been pretty touchy. Mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, I suppose maybe for the fact that maybe yes, the South felt that uh, it was a little bit inferior in some respects to the North or to the uh, people uh, out of the South and that they became affronted if you criticize them in any way. That's a trait and uh, yeah, there might be some good reason for it. Mm -hmm. Well, there almost seems to be um, a dichotomy there. I think half the people who are not from the South feel that it's all like gone with the wind and the other half feels that it's, uh, you know, on, on the poverty level. So you really have quite a, quite a mixture. Yes, you do. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. What changes have occurred since the book was written? What has occurred? Has, uh, have any changes occurred in the South? I mean, if there were another Great Depression, would the South suffer as much? Uh, well, I, I don't think so because of the diversification that has happened in the South. You see, the, 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 the plantation system was uh, um, supplanted by the uh, sharecropper system. Mm -hmm. The sharecropper system was supplanted by the mechanization of farming. And then farming itself had become so specialized that uh, the South does not depend upon the, the agricultural output of the South for, for its economic life. Uh, and uh, it, the industrialization of the South, I think, is, uh, has uh, overcome all the disadvantages of the old uh, agricultural empire. So that there's a mixture of everything going on which is, which is uh, more conducive to, uh, to uh, stable economy. Mm -hmm. So I think the South is very well stabilized at the present time. Yeah, good. Let's talk for just a minute about your collaboration with, in general, with Margaret Burke White. You did <coughs> what, uh, three other books with her? Well, we did a book uh, uh, that more or less covered America. Uh, it, the title of the book is Say Is This the USA? Mm -hmm. And that was a book about just life in general, not any specific uh, subject uh, except uh, American life. Mm -hmm. What is it like in Utah or California or New York or Illinois and so forth? And that was a sort of a general uh, uh, subject uh, uh, of uh, covered with uh, my part and the text that I did had to do with uh, sketches about isolated maybe little incidents and had nothing to do with the photography. The photography was separate completely. Mm -hmm. It told its own story. Yeah. So the two were combined to make this one book. And then that was the second book. Uh, and then the other, the, the one other book was uh, a, 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 a series of sketches and, and uh, photographs uh, done in Czechoslovakia just uh, prior to the uh, you know, Hitler mm -hmm. invasion. Uh, and this was sort of the last gasp of freedom uh, for the people of Czechoslovakia and what we tried to do was to show that the freedom of life just prior to the, uh, uh, the over t uh, being taken over by uh, the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. So that was called North of the Danube. Then <clears throat> uh, the, the fourth book was a book about Russia during the war. Uh, I was a correspondent there for newspapers and magazines and then Bur uh, Margaret Burke White was a photographer for Life magazine. Mm -hmm. And what we did, I, I combined, I mean, I. I used my uh, uh, reportage 
a selection of, uh, of uh, things I had written for magazines and newspapers, and she contributed the photographs that she had done uh, during Moscow under the siege and uh, the, at the front and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that was called Russia at War. Mm -hmm. All right, what was your, your method of working with her? Would, would she take all the photographs and then submit them to you, or would you discuss no, what I, was to be taken? I, 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 was, everything was independent. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, I, I would do what I wanted to do as writing. We'd, we'd take a subject. Uh, the subject would be uh, Czechoslovakia, for example. Mm -hmm. So I would have ideas about what I wanted to do, and she'd be uh, eye for, for, for the uh, photography. Mm -hmm. And uh, it might overlap. <clears> there <throat> might not be any connection whatsoever, but it was a composite that uh, two ideas going together, mm -hmm. one in words and one in pictures, and this composite uh, made, the, uh, made the book. I would imagine, though, that kind of a photographic essay book would be kind of a tricky thing, or it could be, in less capable hands, because you don't want to run the risk of the caption destroying or, or overemphasizing <coughs> what's in the photo. So. Well, yes, 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 I guess you ought to have to have confidence in each other as to uh, what, because if both of you see the same thing, uh, you might get two different angles mm -hmm. of that thing, mm -hmm. but it would be the same subject. I mean, you look at it from this point over here, that would be the text of it, and over here would be the camera, and, but you'd see it together, and that would, uh, that would be the focus of it. Yeah. Of those four books you did together, is there one of which you're particularly proud? Well, I think this, uh, you have seen their faces. That was the first, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, it was a, a, a very, uh, uh, well, very uh, emotional kind of thing because these were people who were really suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, the people in the other books were, you might say, were just ordinary people, ordinary lives, and so forth. But this was, uh, uh, these people were hungry, yeah. or else they had no jobs, or they were uh, had uh, very poor housing. I mm -hmm. mean, you you might find some pictures in this book of people with a half house. You know, the, mm -hmm. there's I think there's one particular photograph there of a house. The whole side of it has been. Uh, blown away by a tornado in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So the people living in a three-sided house. One side is gone completely. Yeah. So that's, uh, that was, uh, makes, it, makes it a very sympathetic oh, project, indeed. I think. Indeed it is. In fact, there are so many photographs in the book that are particularly moving to me. One in particular is near the end of the book. It's, uh, it's of an old woman who obviously has worked very hard all of her life, and the caption reads, I've done the best I knew how all my life, but it didn't amount to too much mm -hmm. in the end, mm -hmm. which I think is, uh, is very moving. Mm -hmm. Did the fact that, that you traveled about a good bit as a boy, I know your father was a, a minister and you traveled about the South, did that give you a kind of perspective that really helped you in, in your later writings? Well, uh, yes, because that's where my uh, understanding and my knowledge, I suppose, uh, originated because I was constantly moving with my parents, and mm -hmm. they were moving constantly every year or so all over the South, and I uh, grew up in that kind of tempo, the style of living that nothing was permanent. We're here today and tomorrow we'd be mm -hmm. somewhere else, uh, but it was a kaleidoscopic idea of life that, that, that interested me because it was always you know, another vista. Mm -hmm. I know I would have the feeling that uh, this time I'm looking at this and maybe uh, next time we move we're going to see something different. Mm -hmm. And there'd be different people. I'd have different uh, friends or playmates, and uh, different school and things of that sort. So everything was was constantly in flux, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I, I still have that feeling. I I I, I don't live uh, any one place anymore very mm -hmm. long. I'm always uh, wanting to go somewhere else or travel or or something of sort. So that had a lot to do with it. Uh, no. At what point did you? Did you know you were going to be a writer, or did you really know that's well, what you wanted to do? Well, I don't know. I, I suppose I had the idea for a long time because when I was, uh, uh, I think the first time I tried anything like that was uh, when I was in high school in Georgia, mm -hmm. and um, I was, uh, the town where I live is Wrens, Georgia, W-R-E-N-S, near Augusta, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a weekly newspaper published there, and I would uh, uh, beg the uh, editor and the owner to let me do something, so he let me turn the, the hand press, mm -hmm. done by hand. You know, I went in, I'd, once a week I'd turn the press to print the paper. Mm -hmm. Well, that led to the fact that maybe I could contribute something about a dog fight, or something, a house burning down, mm -hmm. a fire or something, a wreck, 
So I'd write a little squib or something, and he'd let me put it in the newspaper. So I, got to, I guess I just sort of built that up and kept on doing it. So the next project after that was to uh, be a correspondent for, for daily papers. Mm -hmm. And so there were papers in Augusta and Savannah and Macon that I would uh, uh, submit uh, news items. Of course, nothing was, much was happening. Mm -hmm. In a small town of a thousand people, what's going to happen every day? Mm -hmm. Very little. But anyway, I would write something. Uh, that the sun didn't shine today <laughs> until 12 o'clock or something, or it was raining all morning or something. Mm. So I, I kept that up until I could get a column. I was pay, being paid $2 a column mm -hmm. by all these papers, Savannah, Macon, and Augusta. You'd, pay, you'd paste it up at the end of the month. It was called a paste job. So you'd paste up a column of the paper, and you'd mail that into the paper. And if you had a whole column, they'd pay you $2. If you had a half column, they'd pay you a dollar. Mm -hmm. So I did that uh, through uh, my tenure of education at, at high school. Mm -hmm. And then I went away to college for a while and got away from it, but I was writing jokes for Judge Magazine, which was a humorous magazine in those days. And I would uh, write jokes, and uh, I think I was being paid a dollar of, I think it was about a dollar a joke, when they would take one. Well, you, can, you can't make many jokes, you know. <laughs> it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of energy and a lot of uh, luck to write a joke. Yeah. Well, I was making a few dollars, I suppose. Uh, from these humorous magazines trying to write two-line jokes. Mm -hmm. Then I got out of that and, and uh, got a job on the Atlanta Journal as a cub reporter. Mm -hmm. And I went to uh, work there. I left school, left college, and went to work there at, uh, as a cub reporter, and I was being paid $25 a week, which was great money, because mm -hmm. I'd never made money like that before in my life. And so I kept that up and kept it up for a while. And after a while, I was trying to write a short story instead, in addition to mm -hmm. being a reporter, trying to write a short story. Well, I couldn't get anything published. So I decided that uh, if I were ever going to get any short stories published, I'd better spend all my time at it instead of trying to be a reporter. So I quit mm -hmm. and took what money I had saved out of my paycheck and I decided to go as far as I could with the money I had. So I went, I got as far as the state of Maine. And I dug in there for seven years trying to write short stories. Mm -hmm. Which established writers during your formative years did you really look up to? Well, I, I, I don't know because what I was reading then <coughs> were not more were not established writers, but uh, aspiring writers. Mm -hmm. Those were the days of the so-called Little Magazine. And a Little Magazine was a literary project that was organized by people who could not get their stories printed anywhere else, so they start a magazine mm -hmm. and print their own stories. And there would be an editorship of it, and a half a dozen people would contribute to these magazines. And, and if you uh, wrote a story and wanted to get in on it, well, you'd submit it to this uh, group of people, and uh, maybe they'd take it, but they wouldn't pay any money for it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't pay it. So they, they had a hard enough time of paying the printer, much less the, uh, the, uh, the authors. So yeah. uh, that's how I, uh, the, the stories I read were the, uh, you might say, my contemporaries, mm -hmm. not the established writers by any means. Mm -hmm. We only have a little amount of time left, and this being Cinema Showcase, I do want to ask you something about some of your books that have been made into films, uh, three of them really, Tobacco Road, uh, Claudel English, and God's Little Laker. In general, are you pleased with the screen treatments of your books? Well, my, I, I've come to this conclusion. You see, I, I, I have concluded that it's fine to have a, have a film made, but the film should be an original story mm -hmm. uh, for the film. It should not be a, a, uh, a film of a book mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think you can really get the atmosphere and get the, uh, the whole associative idea, the whole association, uh, of, a st of a novel into a film. I think it has to be a separate project. So from my point of view, I'd much rather, uh, uh, if it were possible, for me, to, uh, I would write an original story, which I've never done. Uh, I would write that in, in preference to having a novel done. Mm -hmm. Because once the novel is finished, well, it has its own, uh, own association. And you try to put it on a, on a film, and you, you, it becomes static. Mm -hmm. 
immediately become static. It's because it's something that's, uh, it's not the novel itself, but something different. So I, I think that uh, I, I much prefer, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I don't know about other people, other writers, but that's my feeling is I'd rather write a story directly for film and not have it in print at all. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right, you worked in Hollywood, I know, for several years in the 40s, I guess. What was that experience like? Was it... Uh... <laughs> well, you've probably heard a lot of stories about Hollywood uh, yeah. life, the writers and whatnot. I was a junior writer. I went out, and you know, this was uh, in, the, uh, in the late, uh, late 30s, and uh, the first time I went. And uh, I had a job offered me. I don't know why, but uh, I was given uh, off the job by... MGM, mm -hmm. and I had a, a, a whale of a salary for, for those days, and for me, a whale of a salary of 250 a week, mm -hmm. which was a fortune yeah. in those days. It was like 2,500 a week. Um, so I was given this, offered this job, and I jumped at it, of course, in those days, because I wasn't uh, surviving otherwise. So I ended up down in uh, New Orleans in a swamp. Uh, where they had a, uh, a, a filming a book, a picture uh, with the title of a wicked woman, mm. and uh, they had a German actress, her, her first picture, and she uh, didn't speak English any better than I did uh, in those days. I mean, grammatically or uh, accent, anything else. I was a southern boy with my southern accent, and she was a German with a German accent. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what, what it amounted to was the fact that I, that was my first uh, writing project in, in the film was to go to Louisiana on location out in the swamp. And we were living in a, in a fishing uh, village uh, on stilts. The water was on down, the bayou was down here, mm -hmm. and they stilted uh, uh, bunk houses up here. Everybody was up here on this, these stilts. And uh, I was there, for, I guess, for several weeks. Mm -hmm. till they made a lot of background shots and so forth and went then now everybody went back to Hollywood and the producer called me into his office said well uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, tell me about the film what do you think of it I said well what film um, <laughs> he said don't you know what you were doing I said I haven't seen any in this storyline I don't know what it's all about I saw him taking some pictures out there of a, uh, of a stand in I never saw the actress I heard about it and heard what she was, uh, her trouble about the uh, English language, but I never saw her. I only saw her standing. And then Prusa said, uh, you mean you haven't written anything? I said, I don't know what to write. <laughs> he said, well, I'll call you when I need you. And that's the last I ever saw him. <laughs> <laughs> we are totally out of time. I don't know where the half hour is gone. I know I've enjoyed it very much. And uh, I want to invite you to come back again sometime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My thanks to all of you for watching tonight. Until next time, good evening.